All right, y'all ready? All right, so when I'm full screen, I'm not gonna be able to see any chat. So you guys will have to unmute and interrupt me if you need me to slow down, go back or do whatever. All right, so. All right, so I am Dave Kamira. My handle on Twitter and pretty much anywhere else possible is Cobalt. And that is what I look like on the internet. It's a old picture that I took a long time ago that I like and I just keep it around. So. I kind of have invested in it. And then I also run and maintain Drift and Ruby, which is a screencast site that I do specifically on Ruby, mainly Ruby on Rails stuff. And you can use the promo code ATLRUG to subscribe at $9 a month. And today I'm going to, I'm going to be talking about dynamic select forms with Hotwire. And essentially what that means before we dive into code, I have just a few slides to show what it looks like and kind of what we're gonna be building. So if we have two select dropdowns and for our brands, we might have something like an Intel and AMD uh, companies. And when we select one of those, we would want the generation dropdown to then populate with all of those relevant selections from the previous select box. So if we select AMD, for example, then once we hit that selection, then the generation would populate with all of the relevant AMD generations of their processors. And doing something like this back before we had Hotwire, it wasn't too bad, but it did still require writing a lot of JavaScript things were pretty much very coupled together. And I found that reusing the bits of code was kind of tedious. And so I recently did another Drift to Ruby episode covering how we would approach this from a more modern stance or viewpoint. So to get started, we will have just a very simple form. So this form, which I think I copied in, okay, yeah, so I don't have the including form tags on this screenshot, but that doesn't matter because really we just have a, if we look at this top div, we have our label, we have a form select for our brand, and then the second option in a form select is the options. So we have, or we are getting all of the brands, we're looping through each one of the brands, and then we are displaying the name and the ID as an array. So that'll get populated into the dropdown for our brand. When you deal with form selects in Rails, you then have the second option, which is going, or the third option kind of, you'll have the, uh, where I just had the include blank is set to true. And that is going to be options for your select. And then finally, you can have any kind of HTML options as the last hash. And then for the generation, it's also simple. We have our form label, we have a select for the generation, but the second option, you'll notice that I just have an empty array here. We don't have anything populated because we do not have any brand selected when you come to create a new form or a new record. And this does pose some issues when you go to edit the record that you would want or you would likely already have a brand selected, but you need to have that generation then selected, that list populated and the proper selection created. So what we're going to do is kind of cover both of these bases in this episode or in this talk. And we're going to first have a look at creating our stimulus controller view parts, and then we'll create our stimulus controller, and then we will tie it all together on the back end. So the first thing, we're going to wrap everything in a data controller dynamic select. This dynamic select is just what we are calling the stimulus controller, and we will have to initialize it later because I did build all of this on a Rails 7 code base, and there are some little nuances, and we can dive into the code a bit later if you guys want to see some more of the specific things around this. So once we have the data controller defined, everything in this data controller is going to be the relevant bits of our form. 
So even outside of this, we would have our main form tag. And then just within the data controller, just for now, I'm showing the, uh, the brand selection. So this should look familiar where we have our data controller dynamic select. And then I'm also specifying a URL value. And this URL value, it's a second line here, it's going to be tied to the dynamic select. So with the data dash dynamic select, that is indicating which stimulus controller we're going to be using. And then we're setting a static value for the URL. And we are just going to call this the generations path. And so the idea here is when we select a brand, it's then going to need to do some kind of action. So in the HTML options, we have a data action, and then whenever it changes, so that means whenever our select box changes, we are then going to call our dynamic select stimulus controller, and then the change function. Within this change function, just to give you, give you a preview of what we'll be doing, we will then need to take in a path or our URL for the generations. And then we can call, make a call out to our Rails application to get the list of generations. So that's really the first step to do in order to get things populated. But once we get a little bit further, we need to, once we get the list of all of our generations, we need to insert it into our second select. So that's where we will have the top bit of code is all the same, but then I've just shown here the second bit of code showing the generations. And so the only thing that I did here that's different is I added the dynamic select target for the secondary select. And this is simply because once we make our brand selection, it's going to make a fetch request to our Rails application to get the list of generations. And then we need to update or insert into the secondary select the list of generation records that we got back from the Rails application. So once we have this part done, that's going to be all you need to do to really create a new record. But the problem comes into play when we need to update a, an existing record. So if we already have a processor uh, selected with the brand generation and all of its values, the issue comes into play when we go to edit that record, the brand is going to automatically appear because we're not doing anything fancy here. This is just normal Rails that it's going to have the brand ID selected. However, for the second one, because we are not passing in the list of generations and we want to also limit what this generation select list is going to have based on what we already had existing with the brand, we need a few more pieces of information. We're going to need to be able to, if I switch to the next slide, we're going to have to be able to target this brand so the stimulus controller can pull out what its value is. And so that's where we have uh, the main select. So we are creating another target that's, um, few lines below. We have our dynamic select for the main select. So this is our primary selection for the brand. And once we make, or when, once we go to edit a page, the stimulus controller will initialize. We can then pull out the main selects brand ID within the stimulus controller. We can make a post or a request to the generations path. We can then populate the secondary select. And if you notice on the third line, we have a selected value. So we have a, another static value that we're going to consume within the stimulus controller. And that is simply, so once we have populated the secondary select, we're then going to be able to mark one of those records or one of those options as selected. And so the generations path that we're creating, it's very simple. It's a second resources. We only need the index action in this case. You would most likely have a full scaffold or a 
full uh, CRUD here. However, just for this example, I already have everything pre-populated. So we only need the index action for this particular use case. And this index action is actually pretty simple because we are just looking for the generation or the brand ID and we're passing in the params ID. So that's going to be the brand ID that we're getting from the stimulus controller. And then we have a format turbo stream. And that's essentially going to then call a uh, index turbo stream.erb file, which I'll show you guys a little bit later, but that's simply just going to then repopulate the secondary select. And we'll also do the selection there. Actually, let me go ahead and uh, just pull that up because I actually forgot that slide. So that is going to be under our app, views, and then generations, turbo stream. So this turbo stream, we're just calling a turbo stream update. So this turbo stream update is going to be uh, sending a request back to the front end and it's going to do an update on some kind of ID. So we are going to have to pass back to our Rails application some sort of DOM ID that we need to target to update. And then within there, that's the DOM ID that we're going to update is the secondary select. But then we can just pass in the options for select we can get all of the generations that we got from our stimulus controller. And then the magic here is the selected. We have our param selected. So this param selected is going to be what the existing value is for that particular uh, record. So if we already had a brand and a generation already populated, we go to edit the record. The brand, if I just go back to my slides, the brand will already be entered, the list will get populated, and then we would also have the selection already there. So if we go back to the code bits, let me go back to my slides here. So far, does anyone have any questions? Nope, thanks. <laughs> Okay, and I'll dive into the code. Uh, I'll show a live demo and we can dive into the code and explore it and I'll make this repo available to everyone. So it's, um, you know, maybe just something y'all can tinker around with. So with a Rail 7 application and with a uh, using Hotwire, we don't have the luxury of just having everything automatically loaded that does seem to be kind of a step backwards from what we had with Webpack, but that's just kind of where we're currently at. So I'm going to, on this second line here, you'll see that we're importing the dynamic select controller from a file dynamic select controller. That dynamic select controller then gets registered with the stimulus application and I'm calling it dynamic dash select. So that is the name that we'll consume within our view, and it's registering it to the dynamic select controller that we imported in on the line above. Dave, do you mind unpacking what you said about a step back a little bit? Does it comp? Is it kind of there's a direction it's going, but to get there meant something, or what did yeah. you mean by that statement? So if I just uh, pull up my terminal, no, eight. So my Rails RC file, this is just something that I typically do whenever I create a new Rails application. It does a few things. And with a Rails 7, which I should be on, yeah, I'm on the release candidate one. Oops. There we go. So instead of using Webpacker, I'm using ES Build. So we don't have some of the fancy um, auto-loading of libraries that we did with Webpacker. So before anything that you created under the JavaScript controllers, like the hello world 
or the hello controller or anything like that would just automatically get loaded in because you could just do a search on all of the underscore controllers and that would automatically get loaded into your stimulus app application. However, I don't think you're able to quite do that anymore. So instead, with using ES Build, we have to, once we import in our application, we have to individually register each one of these stimulus controllers that we're going to use. Does that make sense? So basically, we, we don't really have auto load anymore um, for either technical or or other reasons. Yeah, and I'm sure you could import in a library or do something like that, which would bring back that kind of functionality. Mm -hmm. But just using a fresh Rails application with ES build and JS bundling, you don't have that feature out of the box. Even in the application.js under the controllers, we really don't have anything pointing towards any kind of auto loading. Okay. So that's interesting. That that is interesting. I, I wonder I wonder why that is. I, I suppose the answer may be buried in discussions in the official GitHub. Um I would I would assume so because it is something if you are upgrading a Rails application, that's not something you would normally think about. Mm -hmm. It would probably come to a shock. And it could be a little bit of work, especially if you have hundreds of stimulus controllers. But you know, hopefully a one time effort. That does the syntax there does remind me slightly of Python, where you have to import specific objects from from a thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Dave, I can't carry on. Thank you so much for answering. You you just that was too juicy of a tidbit to leave unpacked, and I appreciate you uh, unpacking. Yeah. Now it has me curious, Frank. Uh, sorry, Dave. Uh, if so, I see on the top there. There's an auto like a uh, auto generated by Bin Rails Stimulus Manifest run mm -hmm. this command every time you add a new controller. Have you run that? You know, I and have I'm never I, will that If you create a new controller, uh, will that pick up uh, and import or do whatever it's supposed to? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious of that. I'm just going to comment those out. Yeah. And I'm going to run it. Hey, look yeah, at let's break something, see what happens. Oh, cool. It, it inserted it for me and it put it in alphabetical order. How fancy of it. That's right. So a one annoying command or macro. Uh, yeah. Yeah. To, to get it to update automatically. Yep. And, you know, thank you for that, Nick. I have never noticed that. <laughs> Out of the like 20 or so times I've come in here and manually done it. I've just always knew what I need to do. Is so this like banner blindness? Like you just, oh, I don't need to read this comment. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that yeah, that's pretty that's cool. cool. Yep. So there's a new tidbit. It is sort of like, like it is sort of like the Python syntax, but it would have to be like from whatever import whatever instead of import whatever from something. Yeah. All right. So to create the stimulus controller. You saw how we just imported it on the previous step. And then this is basically your boilerplate shell for a stimulus controller. One interesting bit is that they renamed the library from stimulus to at hotwired slash stimulus. So if you're using a newer version of stimulus, or if you're starting out, then you might see some differences in the documentation, but they have indicated that this is the path forward. So initially, I'm just going to initialize the stimulus controller with the already knowns that we have. We have our targets of the main select and the secondary select, and then we have our static values with the URL and string. Now I'm actually going to go back a few slides because this is important to note if you are not doing a stimulus controller very often. Notice that the URL value and the selected value I put in the same element that I initialized the controller with. So we have our data controller for the dynamic select. 
And then any kind of values that I am adding into this stimulus controller needs to be done up there as well. If you put it further down in another element, it will not get registered. It'll just be a null value and you'll scratch your head, but I have it defined, but it's not populating what's going on. You have to define it up at the top there. So we have the URL and selected values, and then we also have our two targets for the main select and the secondary select. So skip back ahead. And then, so those are what we already have defined. So then we have that change function. So whenever we change a brand selection, it's then going to call a change function. And this change function, I'm simply just going to call another function fetch. And while there is a JavaScript fetch function, in this particular case with this dot fetch, I'm just calling the fetch function within the stimulus controller. And I'm doing this for a couple of reasons. I could put everything under this code, but I do like breaking things out into smaller methods if possible. So we are making an Ajax request back to our Rails application. We are calling it on this dot URL value. So it is in this case, camel cased, and the URL value refers back up to the static value that we declared in the stimulus controller. And the interesting bit, because we are doing this as a turbo stream response, so we, we are taking full advantage of what we have with Hotwire, we do need to pass in a particular header. The header is um, passed into the fetch request, and it's the accept text vnd.turbo- or turbo-stream.html. And by doing that, it will then go back into our Rails application as a turbo stream response. And that's going to be really important because that's how we have the backend controller set up with handling the response as a turbo stream. And if you wanted to, in the URL value within the view, you could just add the format turbo stream and it would essentially do the same thing. It would add the appropriate header. So once we have that, apparently I had the same slide twice. With this turbo stream response, if you remember or if you've done any research on turbo, it is not giving you back a JSON response or anything like that. It is going to render HTML. That's what Hotwire is, is HTML over the wire. So when we get the response back, we can do some promises. So once we make the request, then we want to make sure we have our text. Then with this HTML that we have, we can then call the turbo render stream message and pass in that HTML. And that'll trigger the turbo on the front end to execute whatever code that we have been provided from the back end. In this case, it is the request to update the DOM with the option selections for our generation dropdown. So if you notice in the fetch URL, at the question mark, I also have a function called this.params, which we haven't defined yet. And that's simply just going to be inserting in all of the different params that we need. So you can use the URL search params to generate a new object that we can then inject in the params that we need. So we are injecting in the ID value, which if you remember is the brand ID. So in the Rails application, controller, it's then going to find all of the generations off of this brand ID. The select is going to be the ID value of our actual HTML element of the secondary select. And that's going to be important because if you remember on a TurboStream response, when you call to update, you need to specify an actual DOM ID that is going to then replace its contents. And that's where we have that secondary select target is to get that ID value that we can then update that uh, select dropdown. And then just so when we go to edit a record, we need to know what the edited record is already selected. So 
that's where we are passing the selected value back to the Rails application as well. Uh, let's see. Oh, and this selected value, uh, the last prems that we are passing in, the selected value, we are the, we are just getting from this new function that is right underneath the changed, where we are just returning the main select target, the selected options. We're grabbing the first thing since we are not allowing a multiple select, and we're getting the value. And so this will all work if we are creating a new record, but then we are still missing a little piece here is when we are going to edit a record. When we are going to edit a new record, we need to be able to see if anything is selected for the brand. And if so, then we need to basically run through this logic again. So here we have a connected function and or this connect function. And whenever the stimulus controller is rendered on the page, it's going to call the connect function. And we're just doing a check to see if the selected the select value has any kind of length. So if there's anything there, then we'll call this dot fetch, which will then go through, make the Ajax request to the Rails application. And so if y'all want to see all of this in action, We can go to our processors, have a whole list. We can create a new one. When we select our brand, it then automatically populated the generations. We can then select our generation, move forward. If we select Intel, it'll then update the generation list, and then we can select a different generation. We can save this, and when we come back to edit this record, it should still have Intel, and then the 11th Gen 5, and it does. So that is pretty much all. Uh, again, you can subscribe for $9 a month on Drift and Ruby, which I do go into more depth on this, and be sure to follow me on Twitter and stuff. That's all. So... Um... That's pretty awesome. And I love how clean it is. <laughs> like, you know, despite the little gotchas about the auto loader or you have to run an update script, um, I've seen a lot of dynamic form implementations that were far more gnarly than this as far yeah. as the code goes. So, yeah. And if you guys want to look at some of this stuff, uh, we can dive into it if y'all want, if you have any questions about it or anything. So I guess I'm, I'm going to have a, a, a trolling question. Um, how is this different than the olden days of rendering a view and using your .js.erb to replace a div uh, with the latest content? If you ask me, this is a bit cleaner. It's also a bit more reusable than the olden days because you basically had to rewrite that implementation almost each time. And this is modern, man. If, if hey, if DHSH says it's new, <laughs> it must be the best, right? No, no. Um, I, I really like a lot of DHH's direction and stuff. I do believe in it, but I don't always drink the Kool-Aid. But in this particular this case, it's an ERB file, not an RB file. I'm still relatively new to newbie to Ruby. So, what is a dot ERB again? ERB is basically the view rendering for the HTML. Um, ERB is okay because it looks like a template file, and I, I um, so it is a template file. Um, Again, I, I do use Ruby, just not as much as I use Python. And it reminded me of Python Django's backend templating language. And I'm assuming that's what it is. It's very similar to that. OK. But it, um, nice. Dave, do you know when 
Hotwire decides to replace a set of content, whether it will do a full replace or does it diff and only apply differences? Yeah, so we can look at the network requests and it will probably tell you, but just to give you the quick answer, it should only update the diff. So I just refreshed the screen, which we've got our generation request. And if we just look at this response, this is the response that when we call, let me go back to the index, uh, not index.js, the controller. Do, do, do. This turbo stream, this turbo render stream message and this HTML, this HTML is that response. So it is then going to just interpret that response. And this response is calling an update action to target the processor generation ID, which is just a select box. And then we have just all of the contents. So it passes the template and then it just inserts into or replaces the contents of whatever that DOM ID is. So it's not doing a full page refresh or anything like that. Yeah, I think what I meant was, um, so, you know, this is a really simple example, but for instance, you know, uh, you can you can kind of extrapolate to a much bigger, much more interactive page. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in this instance, you know, this list of Intel processor generations, um, say that there is an overlap between that and the, the other one, I guess Ryzen or... Um, say there's an overlap of options um, or AMD, right? So I guess my question is if there was an 11th gen i7 AMD and Turbo decides, hey, I'm going to replace the contents of this, uh, of this uh, input, does it see that there is some some set of you know set of in set of string set of the HTML string that is the same and decides not to diff it to save on processor time or anything like that? That's kind of what you know. The reason I mentioned that that's you know we use a lot of stimulus reflex. That's what stimulus reflex does. It runs the HTML diff between the part that it's replacing and the part that it's replacing it with, and only applies updates selectively. Now, obviously, in the case of you know, something as simple as a drop down, it's probably exactly the same or very, very similar. Um, but in the case of a much more interactive application, you may have some like, you know, complicated widgets that, you know, uh, live inside a, a bigger turbo frame and that turbo frame is replacing its HTML. Does that widget also get replaced even if the markup is exactly the same? So that's where things can get a little bit complicated. Um, it's not always a straightforward yes or no, uh, you know, always, but let me show you, give you some insight. Um, I'm coming. I'm, uh, as you're running that, I'm curious too, though, like do we've been working with, uh, doing custom Rubocops and working with syntax trees. I'm, I'm curious if like, if they put a level of inspection where they're like, hey, if the main container of this changed, we're gonna DOM diff uh, and go ahead and let that be inserted versus like at, at what point do we go arbitrarily line by line? And I... ...need the differences if, if it's a, a different between a list, say two, say there's four list elements and only two of them are different, they only actually change and insert those two differences or do they insert the entire uh, new list? Yeah, and that's where on with Hotwire, if you did just have certain parts that you wanted to update, you can uh, use frame tags, which would just update those certain sections. But then you also have the more outer frame tags, which I think is what you're referring to, Nick. Would it then re-render all of these smaller components there? And I, it's hard to answer that because I really don't know. But what I have found is that 
if you don't have that outer frame tag that you're going to repaint everything and just try to find the diffs, then it's almost a uh, moot point. You know what I mean? Because you would have to have some argument for having a frame tag over the entire outer uh, div with all your smaller components. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I, I was just curious. I don't know the answer either. Um, uh, you know, I think because the DOM is a tree, I think once it finds a node in the tree that is, you know, different, it will replace that node. Um, but everything else will stay the same if nothing else is changed. So mm. uh, it might be like a cascading, whatever is the highest point that a change or the entire set of changes uh, can be mapped to is probably the point where they start the replace. That's how uh, that's how React does it when they do their rendering as well. Yeah, so I haven't worked on this application in a bit, but I'm creating a help suite application, which basically is a service desk. So people can, it's a Rails engine. So you can mount it in your Rails application and have a full-blown ticketing system right off the bat. And it's something that I'm going to be open sourcing but one of the things that I did with it was create a dashboard, which the dashboard, I guess I could just show you while this is all loading. The dashboard has a lot of things going on in it, but in each case, I'm just calling a turbo frame tag with a source. So by calling a turbo frame tag with a source, it's going to then render this URL that URL is just going to be a snippet of code that if it contains this my ticket count, then it's just going to update this particular frame tag. So I can have several frame tags on here, all making requests back to the Rails application for each one of these items. And so I just have within here, just some default loading text, just so we're not, I forget what it's called, but when you're doing some lazy loading and then all of a sudden the screen just starts like fluttering down. So this would prevent or keep that from happening to a degree. But on this particular dashboard, it's literally just going through a whole bunch of these frame tags and it might actually answer. Oh, sweet, it's done doing. Yay, M1 Max. All right, so let's go to the help suite. I'm unauthorized, so I have to sign in. Hopefully, I have an account. I think change that no. Uh, probably one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, sweet. So, did you see how that loaded? He's screaming in his chair silently right now from the security <laughs> perspective. <laughs> Amazing. What's that? The same combination I have on my luggage. I said security Frank is screaming silently muted. The password one, four, five, six. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> hey, guys. Sorry I missed work today, Frank. Okay, I'm just saying. Yeah, idiot. So in, in, in my defense, it's on local hosts and it's not routed. So I'm joking. <laughs> get, get off my secure passwords. So each one of these little cards are a turbo frame tag. So if I pull up the uh, network tab and if I just refresh this, it's literally making a fetch request to each one of these. It just has a turbo frame with its contents and the fun bit is I can scroll through uh, the different comments and it's going to just update that particular tag. So this is a preview of something that I'm going to be releasing soon for the world. So. Dave, can you um, pull up the um... Ruby template that um, you set up the two select boxes in, the one that was wrapped with the um, stimulus controller. I had a question about that one. Um, 
one thing that and, and this is very much coming from a place where I'm I'm not familiar with stimulus, have not used it a lot. Um, but I see that the arguments in here are data dynamic select URL value and selected value and data dynamic select target. It seems a bit repetitive uh, given that the data controller is called dynamic select. Is it? Yes. Is there a reason for this, or is, the, is it possible to have multiple stimulus controllers attached to the same DOM element? There is. So with this data controller, oh. if I just add a space here, and if I do a uh, copy con or copy contents, and if I want to then say, um, we could add a data copy contents Oh, okay. that totally makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, so it not only works like this, where you can have a particular element with multiple stimulus controllers, but also if we had an outer div with a data dash controller for the copy contents. So you can then still interact with those two still separately, but you're still targeting the same kind of elements. Got it. That that totally makes sense. I, I know how much DHH loves keeping things dry. So this this is a, a clear indicator of why that, that repetition is needed. So yep. Dave, quick question. Or oh, wait, Aaron, please finish your No, I'm I'm good. One of the things I'm noticing is um and maybe because stimulus is here and it's awesome, we should just all use it. But you know me, security guy likes to argue for uh reduced interdependencies what level of complexity do you say no this isn't just plain javascript without any modules because it's just doing a little dom manipulation i'm gonna pull out stimulus like when do you make that that delineation so like maybe for v simple validation like hey fill something in this field maybe you can stick to truly plain ES6 JavaScript with no external dependencies. Yeah, and I think stimulus is simple and unobtrusive enough where it's almost a non-issue. Mm -hmm. It's a bit um, like not, I mean, you're using Rails, so you might as well use Rails. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, really, this seems complicated, but I mean, we're talking about 42 lines of code here. Right. And, and it's mostly that, dynamically generated. No, not yeah. in this case. Yeah. And I've gone through situations where creating a React component, <clears throat> even extracting the view over to a separate component where you're just. Oh, but you're bringing in React. I was asking about the delineation between literally an if statement uh -oh. after the document ready that does something. Or or this, I, I I follow what you're saying. By the time you bring in React, you might as well use Stimulus since it's it's right here. So I would say um, from personal experience, doing this outside of a Stimulus controller, if we were to just literally have in our uh, JavaScript, if we were to put some code in here, like you know, um, document get element by ID and then try to add in the appropriate listeners and all that. Yeah. The problem that I found is you get leaks. You get this particular JavaScript executing on pages that it was never intended to. And you get situations where you get some weird interactions. Mm -hmm. So what if I'm on a another uh, part of my application that's no longer dealing with our product list, but it is talking about like a family tree or something. And Oh, I, I've had to debug this as apps have been upgraded because they were written at some point where maybe things weren't minimized together and then Webpacker came along and now it's like minimized differently and now the whole JavaScript file crashes so all javascript breaks and then you have to start saying like wait does this page contain this element that this block of code or you have to like catch an ex yeah i i follow what you're saying it's very leaky yeah so which is uh which is more of a security risk 
having very leaky JavaScript that's hanging around all hanging around all over the place or tightly scoped JavaScript that does something. To be dynamic. realistic, a modern application is probably gonna still be doing asset pipeline and webpacker and hotwire all in the same thing and it's gonna be a gnarly mess for a while. I th I think and maybe that's <laughs> something to point out and I might be very wrong. Like you don't need it maybe in this instance or case you need uh, stimulus to get the functionality that we're looking for, but like Hotwire itself does not require, or maybe under the hood it uses stimulus, um, but it doesn't, to do some of the things that you're doing, you don't actually have to use or wrap it in the stimulus controller. I might be very wrong. I mean, I'm also in the odd place where I maintain 15 year old Ruby on Rails applications. So, uh, you know, uh, anyway, Dave, I don't want to take away from it. I appreciate you kind of just verbalizing that that challenge and why this framework is awesome and and people should you know pay attention to that. Yeah, and I mean, you might be able to do a turbo frame tag or something and then add within your application JS a listener when that change selects and then does something. but you know again, we're still talking about just writing 40 some odd lines of javascript to handle some what could be some pretty complex functionality so i mean if someone had an existing i mean i i'm trying to make this generalized so i i'm not like dave here are my problems i have with my day job no <laughs> but you know when someone maintains an app of some age right many of us do uh, pre this capability um what might it look like in your mind to do a a uh an up uh, like a conversion an upgrade like just imagine in your mind's eye one of your your previous you know examples where you did this in react what kind of steps would it take to make that this uh, use this mechanism instead well so just to kind of give you my own apps older than two years old need to be completely rewritten so just <laughs> So I started Drift and Ruby on a Rails 4 application. So I was using Turbolinks and there was no Webpacker. Stimulus did not exist. Mm -hmm. And so I had the beauty and the luxury of going through the upgrade process of bringing it up to Rails 5. And then I introduced Webpacker and got all that up and working and got all the JavaScript moved out of the asset pipeline into the uh the packs and then stimulus came around and i started wherever i had individual javascript files or just within my application js i had some javascript code i looked to see if there was an opportunity to more isolate it and make it into a stimulus controller and so i did and it, it took a while uh to do that but the nice bit about it is that I was able to do it in pieces. I didn't have to do it all at the same time. And now I'm going through the process of removing Webpacker from Drift and Ruby and moving it over to ES Build, which is seemingly not that big of a deal either because it's still following still a lot of these same methodologies. I just have to as we now discovered under the index.js, I'll have to come in and run this to update my manifest of all my stimulus controllers. So it's a process, but I mean, if I had a very old application that I still had to maintain, I would really look to see, is this a application that needs to be up on the latest and greatest? Because Rails 7 is still going to support Webpacker. They are just saying that it's not our ideal or our flagship way to go about things anymore. So I think that um, there still is quite a bit of time before anything is like completely deprecated and you had to go a different direction. But I do think if you are upgrading from a Rails 4 era days application and you do need to update it to a more modern stack just for security reasons, then I probably would still go through the headache of transitioning to Webpacker simply because what I'm finding is then to switch to ES build is still a 
easier process than if I had just gone from my Rails 4 structure straight to the structure that we're going to see in Rails 7. Just as far as the JavaScript assets go. Well, of course, Webpacker had gems in Rails 4, and you could kind of step it a little bit. Um, one strategy I have accepted um, in certain circumstances is to derailsify the uh, JavaScript usage and just go back to just straight up script tags in the template, uh, which decouples that aspect completely from Rails which then usually lets you lift without worrying so much about that. It's a different approach, but it, it does function. Like if the JavaScript can interact with the page it, and you update the middleware, the front end doesn't care about the middleware to some extent. Yeah. Does that also work seamlessly with uh, Turbolinks or uh, Turbo with visits? Uh, Turbolinks is a little weird. Um, I have had issues with turbo links sometimes, um, but it works more time, depending on how you structure it, it, it may not cause a user impacting problem. One area where I definitely uh, know that turbo links uh, does not work well is if you had any older code that uh, did like a meta refresh on a page. Like if you're like, hey, are we still processing? Oh, let me refresh the page to see if the status has changed. Um, that does not work with TurboLink. So you end up jumping back to whatever page the first render was, but not where TurboLinks has updated in place the page as the user navigated around. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that sort of polling is not super ideal, but you know, if you're if if you if you're it's a lot simpler than uh, doing uh, web sockets if all you need is to update like a, you know, a processing page. It just sits there and loops until it's done, right? And just periodically refreshes. That was kind of the old way to do that sort of page. Yeah. Yeah, or a long polling or something. Yeah. Anyway, does that answer that question? Again, this is like, I, I understand that this is like crazy unique, like, uh, sometimes when people join our company, they're like, you know, they they think they've had, they know the hard life and then it's like, nope, there really is old code that does old things and uh, we really have to keep it working. Anyway. Yeah. So. Which at the time was like cutting edge, super awesome. Like, look, we're getting live updates on the front end. Hell What's yeah. You got a little end. spitty thing and everything. Yeah. Um. I don't need to regale folks of the days of uh, IE3 and Netscape in JavaScript where you had to literally do browser detection and do different things. Oof. And then what was the other thing? Uh, uh, using hidden iframes as your as your callback layer to to submit forms and then JavaScript to read it back out because that all that would work with IE5, I think. Not not to interrupt it, uh, but Dave, you mentioned, and I think it was you, you mentioned uh, the we talked a little bit ago about like the evolution to get to get built. Uh, you you mentioned I think in a previous meeting another potential step already in the work past ES built uh, to work in this new kind of uh, asset pipeline. Uh, is is that true? I think it was you. Now there is prop shaft coming out, which is going to be more of a replacement to sprockets, but it's not a stepping stone to uh, move to ES build. It's actually, let's get rid of sprockets and here comes in something completely new. So does that, I mean, I, does that, my questions are like, does that, would you, if you were on a Rails 4 application wanting to upgrade, would you want to, go through WebSocket to ES build, knowing Sprockets is six months, a year, or sorry, uh, shoot, prop shaft is uh, like a year away, six months away, like, or are they are are they going to be a different 
enough upgrade process that you would want to just wait to go to prop shaft instead of making that uh, journey through uh, journey through it to ES build. I think if you have an existing application, getting it up to date with ES build first um, is going to be a easier route than trying to add in prop shaft and then you know updating the JavaScript stuff. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Yeah. And Frank, um, here's a more modern way to do that uh, kind of spinner stuff. I made an episode a while ago on real-time updates from background jobs with stimulus and action cable. It's a pretty crazy, crazy thing. Um, so I'll have to check it out. I've got a couple observations um, from what we've, you know, we've spent a lot of time working in stimulus controllers um, for my day job. And then I've filled with them in free time. Um, the biggest one to me is uh, stimulus does not support TypeScript, uh, which is a big drag for, you know, at least my personal taste. Um, it's mostly surrounding the targets and values uh, because those are dynamically, you know, similar to the way Rails use it heavily, you know, overuses method missing. Um, those those values are dynamically generated when that controller is um, is compiled. So TypeScript is not uh, is not a big fan of uh, of stimulus. Um, one of the other things, you know, kind of going way back in the conversation um, when. Frank, you mentioned uh, kind of like why not just use jQuery or inline JavaScript. Um, one of the big things that I've always found with using inline JavaScript is, you know, if it's a useful enough piece of JavaScript, you're going to want to use it in other places. Um, you know, obviously for like super custom or one off type scripts like that works. Um, but I found that like, you know, having the ability to use a stimulus controller allows you to on any page at any time um, as long as that javascript was loaded in the head um, to to bring you know you know we have a couple utility stimulus controllers one of them being like we can take a like a timestamp and format it to the user's local time um, and we don't have to put that javascript um, you know, on each page where we want to use it, we just, we wrap it in a data controller um, called relative timestamp formatter, right? Um, so any piece of the UI where we want to use it, it's really easy, you know, it's just this one utility. Now, I know you can do that through, um, you can also do that through the asset pipeline, um, but I've, I've found that like debugging uh, is a lot easier with, with, the stimulus controller because I know exactly like where this where this um, piece of sorry where this controller is acting because I had to declare it. Does that make sense? A user account, you can actually do it server side as well with Rails. You can around you can set a time zone at the controller level based on the current user and and all the places it's dropped can be formatted. Um, but that's a cool use and and a good point about um, reusable JavaScript controllers. Um, so and Nick, it looks like some people have figured out how to get TypeScript working with stimulus controllers. Uh, I don't know if this directly addresses the issues you were having with the targets and stuff, but this does look to be. I don't know if I've seen this because it's in German. German, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can do an auto translator and, or just you know read the code and get some indication. But I'll post this link. Yeah, that'd be great. I just know that in searching for it in the past, pretty much every issue that I've seen on the uh, stimulus GitHub repository has been like either some super hacky custom solution or, you know, right. just just don't don't use TypeScript. 
And Nick, thank again, thank you so much for sharing uh, your viewpoint about where you have realistically found it very, very useful for your your work. Yeah, when I was originally making Drift and Ruby, and uh, because part of the structure that I do is I self-host all the videos. They're stored on S3. They get originally they were loaded into a video element, and the JavaScript code to handle that it was buggy and just really kind of crazy. And it wasn't until I added stimulus where when you um, would go back to the page or use the back button, then navigate back, that it would actually work properly. So I think just with the combination of Turbolinks and Stimulus, they do play very nicely together. And I didn't have to worry about doing the document uh, on Turbolinks load, initialize this video element. And it also allowed me to more easily pave the way on doing the adaptive bitrate streaming, where I have people watching the videos from many other countries across the world. So sometimes their internet connection is a lot slower. So I actually do two compressions of the video, a lower quality that's still readable, and then the full 1080p. And then just plugging that in to do all that stuff with the stimulus controller was so much easier than just trying to do it without it's definitely possible without you know i did it but it just always felt buggy or just not that quite fully satisfied feel uh, so i have a question um in uh so you know reading stim uh this uh DHS is uh, right up on stimulus. I think one of the, his recommendations is that when you develop these controllers, you make them as generic as possible so they can be applied in multiple contexts, like like your you know this like this dynamic select you created, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that in practice though? Is that is that something that's how does that work in practice? Is it is that is that the case a lot of the times or just some of the time? And most of the times you're writing like really specific controllers. I'm just curious to how applicable it is because it's not like most components that I see these days, like on the other and other frameworks, they're very specific to the template and you know everything else. And I think that's like one of the more interesting aspects of stimulus. I would say it depends on your situation. So if I am doing something like a dynamic select, then I would try to make it as generic as possible, which makes it more complicated on the front end where you are having to then declare values and stuff simply because you need those kind of things in order to pass back into the Rails application through the stimulus controller. However, in other situations like the video element that I was talking about that I do on Drift and Ruby, I made that very specific. So I'm not going to be able to reuse that anywhere else in the application, nor do I have any intention to. So I had no problems breaking that kind of convention because I'm making it so specific for this one particular use case. So I would say, you know, if you have a larger application where you have a lot of different stimulus controllers, I would maybe just do yourself a uh, future favor and say, you know, like dynamic or something, or this is a one-time use kind of deal. You know what I mean? Just so you have some indication of like, okay, yeah, we have this controller, I can consume it without modifying it. I just need to follow this particular convention. Cool, yeah, that's a, that makes sense. Dave, I just want to say thanks for the presentation and all the work you do for uh, Drifting Ruby and, and uh, participating in the Ruby and Rails community. Um, Thank you. I have to drop, but this was great. I really enjoyed it. And if I may, a final shameless plug, Wheel is recruiting. <laughs>
uh, if you want to do Ruby on Rails. If you're interested also in JavaScript, we are uh, we're accelerating like the way healthcare works in this country. So let's do it together. Uh, but again, thank you, Dave, for for all this, and uh, Frank for coordinating the whole thing. Um, but uh, I'll catch you all later. Okay, Aaron. Have a good one. See you next year. Bye. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But for a better 2020, 2022 without any more Greek letters on variants of this pandemic nonsense. Sure, sure. 2020 well, round two. see ya. So does yeah, anyone have any final questions for Dave uh, before we kind of wrap into the next phase, kind of closing business? Or Dave, I don't mean to cut you short. Do you have anything else you want to add? No, I'm good, man. Awesome. Going, going. Dave, thank you so much. And I and I will definitely say round of applause. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>